Well, good evening and welcome to Q&A, our adventure in democracy where you get to ask the questions. And to ask those questions, our dynamic and engaged studio audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well, last week, for our very first Q&A, we were joined by the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. That was a one-off. So this week and from here on in, we'll have a panel of politicians and thinkers to answer your questions. Over on my right, Indigenous leader and former ALP National President, Warren Mundine. <laughs> Tony Abbott is the Shadow Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Louise Adler is the head of... Louise Adler is the head of uh, Melbourne University Press. And to my left... <laughs> we love them so much. And to my left is Tanya Plibersack, Minister... Plibersack, I beg your pardon, Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. And Senator Bob Brown is the leader of the Australian Greens. Welcome them to our panel. Well, before the program, our audience members submitted their questions for tonight's panel. We've chosen those we think are the best... And most importantly, the members of the panel have not seen any of the questions. They'll be answering them off the cuff. Each of the questions will kick off a new topic of discussion and our audience will have the chance to jump in and ask follow-ups as the discussion proceeds. And if you're watching this on TV in the Eastern States, you can put your questions via SMS by simply texting your name, address and question to the number on your screen, 197 197 Triple two. So start sending your questions so we can throw them into the mix. Let's go now to our first question. It's from Jess Newt. Hi. Um, I want to ask Tanya Plibersek, why is it that Kevin Rudd and the government have ignored advice from various government departments that the proposed fuel watch scheme will actually increase petrol prices, further hurting working families? Well... The, the right, Cabinet question. documents that were leaked suggested that um, a number of departments, four departments, had uh, opinions on the Fuel Watch scheme. Um, there were different opinions from the ACCC that had done the detailed econometric modelling on the proposed Fuel Watch scheme. The uh, Commissioner was in there, Graham Samuel, talked to the Cabinet about it and explained why he thought this Fuel Watch scheme would help working families by increasing competition in the fuel market. And uh, on balance, the Cabinet decided to go with his advice because he'd done much more detailed work and modelling on the scheme. Now you've got the uh, Federal Police after the leakers. Don't you think the public had a right to know if four major economic departments had given contrary <laughs> advice to the ACCC? Tony, um, Tony would know this, that in a Cabinet process you have a variety of different views expressed. What we want from our public servants is that they give... <clears throat> frank and fearless advice. When you get a variety of advice, it is the job of the government of the day to make a judgment about what is the best thing for the Australian public that they have been elected to represent. Uh, I think that it is quite important that public servants feel that their advice to the government is confidential so that they can give that advice as frankly as they wish to. It is absolutely standard procedure to have different sources of advice, coordinating comments on a particular proposal. In this case, there were a variety of views, but the ACCC made a very convincing case based on the very detailed work they did. OK, very briefly, and, and to answer my question, uh, do you feel comfortable, a new government careful about people's rights, comfortable about conducting a witch hunt? For leakers. Tony, I don't think it's a witch hunt to ask if someone has um, broken the law by leaking Cabinet documents, who is responsible for that action. The reason that Cabinet documents are confidential is that so senior public servants feel comfortable giving frank advice to the government of the day. All right, Tony Abbott, you've been in the trenches. That's mm. fair enough, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. But the interesting thing is that the new government is already leaking, Tony. I mean, normally it takes many years yes, a little, a little before, bit like, before, a, little before, bit like before a government... Well, <laughs> leaking going on all around. Tired old governments leak. New, smart, clever, intelligent governments aren't supposed to leak. And the fact that this government is leaking so badly so early is a pretty worrying sign. Warren Mundine, let, let me just, just throw something to you. I'll, I'll come to the audience in a second, but let me just come to you, uh, Warren Mundine. Do you have a feeling, or do you think there's a feeling in the, the Labor Party now, given this leaking, evidently from the public service... Uh, there should have been a night of the long knives after all rather than a sort of reconciliation that uh, Kevin Rudd proposed. Uh, look, I, I think 
you know, I agree with Tanya in this, not surprisingly. But, it, you know, the governments are in, in, in business and everyone get, are given advice. And they're given a wide variety of advice and people are pretty strong about their advice. And, then, and as, a, as a leader, as a person in charge, you make the decision. You have to then pick what's the best advice that you're going to run with. And I think that's exactly what's happened. They got the best advice... They, they, they had looked at it, they made their decision and they thought that was the way to run with it. And I think that's the best way to do it. All right, let's go to our next question from the audience. It comes from John Fennec. Uh, my question is, why is the government not taking the opportunity now to actually be honest to Australia and say that oil prices can only ever go up? It's a finite resource and hence we should try and reduce our reliance on it. I think it's got to be to you first, Tanya yeah. Plibersek. Well, I think we all agree that we do need to um, reduce our reliance on oil. And, in fact, if you look at the most recent budget, you'll see a very substantial infrastructure fund there that will be uh, available for projects, including public transport in major cities. That's something that the previous government wasn't interested in as a federal government. They weren't, um, they weren't prepared to invest public funds in that type of way. Um, we've also got um, a, a number of um, uh, projects when it comes to um, uh, energy innovation in other areas. We do understand that this is something that we need to uh, address with Australians. We're promoting um, the design of a, an Australian hybrid car, for, ex an, for an example. What we need to Can do... Can I just interrupt you there? Because I heard the Prime Minister talk about this hybrid car in Parliament today, and it's quite interesting because uh, when you actually look at the policy detail... It's not meant to come online till the money that $500 million that you're putting up for is not even coming online till 2011. If I'm right, that's after the next election. Well, we're saying that we understand that we do need to change our reliance on fossil fuels. There are a number of things that we're doing to do that. Um, but this fuel watch, the fuel watch scheme. Do you agree about the hybrid car then? The, well,. <laughs> There are a range of policies that we're doing, Tony. We're doing them over a number of years. I can't remember the start date of, of every one of those policies. But the, um, the important thing about the Fuel Watch scheme um, is not that it, it, it's not designed to lock in fuel use or to make uh, you know, um, petrol use the, the only way of the future. The important thing about it is that it introduces competition uh, in the petrol market, it gives consumers the ability to make choices about where they shop for their petrol. We don't think that this is a, a silver bullet to reliance on fuel. We just think it makes it a little bit easier on the family budget for people to be able to shop around. We're giving them the option of shopping around with the knowledge of where fuel prices are cheaper. And I can't understand why people would object to that. All right, let's go to Bob Brown. Um, I'd like to hear your response on that, particularly on the hybrid uh -huh. car. And then we'll go to the audience. So have a think about whether you want to respond. Well, you're right. It's, it's 2011. <clears throat> it's after the next election. And um, we're bringing hybrid cars into this country under this government with a 10% tax on them. If you want to bring in a Humvee or a big petrol guzzle, it's a 5% tax. Uh, it's, it's totally back to the front. There's a 33% luxury. But, but there's something even more that, No, just let me finish on this. Yeah. This, is, this is deck chairs on the Titanic stuff. The Greens have been warning about this, and so have world expert, experts for years. Christine Milne got up a Senate inquiry, which pointed out the importance of this years ago. But both the big parties are in denial. Fossil fuels are producing 10 to 20% of the greenhouse gases in this country. That's got a direct impact on our grandkids. What about public transport? What happened to the budget? Why aren't we putting billions into fast, efficient public transport instead of pouring it into gas guzzling to other transport? There's, there's something even more significantly say. wrong here, because on the one hand, you had Kevin Rudd saying before the election that he'd get petrol prices down, but at the same time, he was saying that he was going to whack a tax on carbon to put petrol prices up. Now... You know, I'm not saying which of them is right. I'm just saying you can't do both, no, and that was convenient. what Kev and that's what Kevin Rudd was trying to was trying to do. Okay, let's see if there, yes, we've got a question right up the back there in the audience. Let's hear from uh, this gentleman. This is mainly.